but there is early evidence of people uh, living in the Amazon from a couple of places in Brazil. Uh, down in the Brazilian Shield, there is archaeological evidence, various places along close to the mouth of the Amazon, and then also a way down here in a couple of places in Chile, uh, where there is uh, good evidence of, of people living there. And they're still arguing over how long people have been there, but a minimum of 12,000 years, probably more like uh, 20,000, maybe as much as 40,000 years. And uh, they keep pushing back the date for the arrival of people in North America as well. It used to be thought that uh, uh, 15,000 years was the maximum for people up here. But it's probably, well, if they were here 40,000 years ago, they were almost certainly here 40,000 years ago as well. That's not the only theory about how people got here, though. Uh, there are, uh, you know, it's possible that uh, Polynesian seafarers made it across the ocean. Uh, you remember, you may remember uh, Thor Heyerdahl, or however you pronounce his name, the Norwegian guy. He came down here and built rafts and uh, out of balsa wood, and then sailed across the Pacific that way. Uh, I mean, people were in Easter Island way over here a long, long time ago where you have the giant heads. Uh, obviously, they made it there. It's about, uh, I think that's about 1,500 miles from uh, no, exactly the mainland one. of South America. Uh, you know, so uh, early people were obviously capable of crossing long distances by ocean. But uh, what about the, their impact in South America? Uh, at the time of Columbus's arrival, uh, they estimate that, uh, from historical records, uh, the priests that went with uh, some of the first expeditions uh, into the Amazon area recorded uh, large towns, large populations, large farms, and they estimate that there might have been as many as six million people living in the Amazon region uh, uh, around the time that Columbus arrived. And they found evidence of fairly complex societies uh, down in Bolivia, in the Bolivian uh, Amazon, there's areas where people built roadways uh, through seasonally flooded areas. They had, uh, you know, these raised roadways, rectangular areas that they may have used for agriculture or ceremonial purposes. Uh, up in the Brazilian Amazon here, there's evidence of large roadways that connected different communities. And you also have extensive areas of uh, therapy. Terra Prieta. Uh, it's a black dirt uh, that you don't find anywhere except where people were living. And they find, you know, hundreds of thousands of pieces of uh, clay pots and things like that in these soils. So they're obviously created by people, and they're very rich soils for agriculture. And, uh, you know, the, the people living in Brazil seek them out and use them for growing their garden plots because they are such a rich soil in comparison to a lot of the other soil, which is very poor. And the, the other soil here is poor basically because you have so much rainfall, uh, a lot of the nutrients get washed away. Uh, any nutrients that uh, don't get sucked up by plant roots very quickly end up in the water and they get carried out into the Atlantic Ocean, uh, along with all the sediments and things like that. And uh, out here at the mouth of the Amazon, there's so much there's water flow, and a little digression, but uh, you can get fresh water uh, 100 to 200 miles offshore still. Uh, you know, you dip a bucket in, you're, you're not even in sight of land, you're out in the ocean, you dip a bucket in, you pull it up and it's fresh water. Uh, just because there's so much water flow out here. And there's about uh, a sediment cone around here of silt and dirt and mud and everything that has uh, fallen out of the water once it stops flowing quickly that's 11,000 feet thick so uh, you know two two miles thick of sediments out here and that's all former Andes mountains basically okay so uh, back to the people so about six million living in there uh, when Columbus arrived uh, he brought some nasty things with him. One of them was smallpox, uh, another one was uh, domestic animals like pigs, which created havoc uh, in the 
jak wody wiatrem oddychanie. Tańczą panowie niewidzialni na moście w Awinią. Zielone staroświeckie granie, jak anemiczne pączki ciszy. Odetchnij drzewem, to usłyszysz, jak promień naprężony ton. Jak na najcieńszej wiatru gamie Tańczą liściaste suknie panien Tańczą liściaste suknie panien Na moście w Awinią W drzewach w zielonych okien ramie Przez widma miast srebrzysty gotyk Wirują ptaki połowo złote jak lód nieco uciekły z rąk W lasach zielonych bialołanie Uchodzą w coraz cichszy taniec Tańczą panowie, tańczą panie Na moście w Awinią Tańczą panowie, tańczą panie Na moście w Awinią Panowie, tańczą panie na moście w Awinią. Yes, uh, <laughs> you know, horses, cows, a few other things. But uh, the people that lived here had no immunity at all to smallpox and to other uh, European and old world diseases. They'd been isolated long enough. Uh, there hadn't been successive groups of people coming over. And they figure that over 90% of the population of both North and South America, the native population died within uh, 100 or 150 years of the arrival of Columbus. Uh, so that had a devastating effect on all of these cultures, a lot of the communities. If you think of your town, you know, kill nine out of 10 people, you know, what happens? You know, your institutions fall apart, you have no more government, you have no more organized religion, your schools are meaningless. And so when explorers started to come in here, uh, mostly this, uh, they started exploring the interior of the Amazon after the majority of the people had already died out. They found small tribes that were wandering around. They, didn't, uh, they weren't very organized, very primitive lifestyle. Uh, but basically, they, th what they found were the survivors, you know, who were just kind of stumbling around, you know, uh, wondering what happened to their world and, uh, and just trying to survive this major disaster. And so you have the picture painted of, you know, the Amazon is inhabited by savages who have no culture, they have no writing, uh, they have no mathematics, they don't make any tools, they just use, you know, <coughs> a stone for axes or something like that. And that wasn't, the, that wasn't originally the case because they had well-developed trade networks. Uh, they brought in items from the mountains down into the Amazon and exported things like, uh, Parrot feathers or Quetzal feathers. Oh, uh, if, uh, skins, when we're done with the uh, lizard, if you want to see uh, an lizard that can run really uh, fast, uh, there's about 3,000 pure blood Yagwe Indians left and another couple of thousand who are mixed. Blood. Uh, some of the older people still speak only Yagwe, they don't speak any Spanish, but uh, most of the younger people, their main language is Spanish, and in another generation, the Yagwe language will probably be extinct. Uh, they are trying to teach it in some of the schools, the, uh, in Golden some of the native communities. But the influence of the outside fast. area, they, they only small number of native was, speakers uh, is just so small. Was swimming in a and, uh, I mean, the, 
one of the communities down here that we passed uh, last night coming in, you saw the electric lights. Uh, the first thing that happens when they get a generator is everybody goes out and gets a TV <laughs> if they can get one. What language is all the TV in here? Spanish. You know, so the kids are watching TV growing up, uh, hearing Spanish, they're taught in schools, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the, the language is going to die out. Uh, there's you know, unless some disaster happens and all the rest of us die off and leave the native people alive, uh, you know, which doesn't seem to be too likely. But uh, originally the Yaguas and uh, various other people in the area, they did live along the rivers. Uh, they hunted, fished, uh, did slash and burn agriculture. And slash and burn agriculture, if you don't have a huge population, works very well. Basically what you do is you clear an area of land you let the forest fall down, you know, cut down the trees, let it dry, then you burn it. Uh, and that clears off all the leaves, the sticks. The big tree trunks are still there, the stumps are still there, uh, but all of the ashes are around the ground. And immediately after, you plant corn or uh, some other crop, yucca. Uh, corn originated in Mexico uh, or Guatemala, somewhere in that area and uh, was introduced to the Amazon area well before European contact. Uh, you had potatoes up in the mountains, uh, they originated here. Yucca, or cassava, originated in the Amazon. It was one of the original crops cultivated by people here. And so they plant these crops, and uh, you know it grows well for two or three years, and then the soil becomes exhausted, and the crops don't grow so well, and you just move somewhere else and you clear a new patch of forest to repeat the process. And meanwhile, the original patch grows back up into forest, second growth, <laughs> uh, sort of mimics a natural process where you have a big tree fall that comes, uh, you know, that falls down, or you get a little tornado that goes through and it might knock down a couple of acres of uh, forest. And so it's, uh, you know, really sort of matches the uh, ecological cycle. Uh, but one of the things that the, the people do is when they abandon a farm patch, they also plant in a lot of useful trees. Uh, different kinds of palm species they use for fruit. Uh, and a lot of palms have very oily or uh, uh, protein-rich fruit. Uh, they're not a sweet fruit. It's uh, you know, a very good uh, food source. You have, uh, think of a coconut. ...diversity of plants, you have what is called alpha diversity and you have beta diversity. Alpha diversity is just the number of species that you find in a specific area. Uh, so there's a one hectare plot of trees that uh, will go by one of these days here in the forest. Uh, so it's uh, one hectare, about two and a half acres. It has uh, 610 trees in it with a diameter bigger than 10 centimeters at uh, about this height. And if you took a uh, two and a half acres in New Jersey or New York, how many species of trees do you think you would have? 10, 15? 10 maybe, 12, 15 if it's, you know, really, really diverse. Uh, in this plot of land, which is just uh, oh, about 400 meters from here, there are somewhere between 310 and 320 different species of trees. So that's extremely high diversity. It's uh, on the order of a world record. I think the, the world record is someplace in Ecuador, which has a confirmed 320 species of trees. Some of the trees here still aren't identified. They don't know what they are, you know. So until they get a, a, an identification on them, they can't really say it's super diverse. Okay, uh, so that's alpha diversity. So to start off with, at least in some places in the Amazon, you have very, very high diversity of trees in a single place. Then beta diversity is what happens if you go from this spot here at Chima from Madre Selva down to Paucarillo, uh, the next station that we'll go to upriver uh, a little, a few miles. <coughs> Do you have the same species of trees or is there a change in the species of trees or any other kind of plant or animal that uh, you're looking at? 
uh, between those two areas. So at Paucarillo, there's another one hectare plot. And that one has, uh, oh, it's probably about 550 trees, uh, something like that. Uh, its diversity is much lower. It only has about 200 species of trees. So, uh, you know, a third less of the diversity that uh, we have at this part here. But about half of the species that are in this plot are not found at Madre Salva. So even within a small area, if you go 10 miles, you're having species of trees replacing other ones. Uh, so that both of these things tell you that uh, there is a very, very high diversity of uh, plant life in the Amazon because to start off with, in one little spot you have a big diversity. You go over here, you also have high diversity, but it's totally different. Or it's, you know, a lot of it is different. So that is something that you don't find in uh, in temperate areas, and you don't find it to the same extent in other tropical areas either. <coughs> Insects have a very high diversity because a lot of them feed on trees, and a lot of them are very specialist. Uh, you know, they eat a specific type of uh, leaf, they uh, burrow in the bark of specific kinds of trees, they uh, infest the seeds of a different group of trees, and so if you have a high diversity of trees, you end up with a high diversity of insects because they also specialize on a resource. And a lot of the trees and the other plants here, they, they produce toxins to protect themselves, but there's an arms race. The insects uh, are capable of developing ways of uh, overcoming the toxins, uh, either by uh, you know changes in their digestive system or changes in the behavior. Uh, some plants have uh, uh, resin glands in the leaves and some kinds of insects learn how to puncture those resin glands and let all of the the resin or the sticky stuff bleed out and then after that happens then they go ahead and eat the leaf uh, you know so they've they found a way of getting around the defense that the tree has so you have a high diversity of uh, insects uh, many many different species and the insects that are the most abundant here are ants And uh, ants do a lot more here than they do in the temperate zone. Uh, you have uh, predatory ants. Uh, we'll see some big ants. They're about uh, one inch long. They're called uh, isula here. But in Costa Rica, they call them bullet ants, balas. And uh, supposedly, if you're stung by one of them, it feels like you're being shot with a bullet. In other places, they call them 48-hour ants, because that's how long the pain is supposed to last. Uh, I think they're overrated. I, I think I've been stung 25 or 26 times. I've, I've lost count, but it, I, I feel it for about eight hours. Uh, but, but, you know, some people may react differently as well, because we had one guy here who was uh, with a school group, and he got stung by one, and he promptly fainted. So, you know, <laughs> take, take your chances. Uh, so you, you have some very predatory ants. Uh, you have other ants that eat seeds. Uh, you have ants that eat nectar, uh, ants that pollinate flowers, uh, and a lot of uh, plants here use nectar to attract ants as a protective device. Uh, they'll have little, uh, you know, if you have the leaf, there's a large number of species of plants here that will have a little gland or sometimes various glands in different places on leaves, or even on the stem. And these glands produce sugar water, and so the ants come and they drink the sugar water from the leaves, and while they're, you know, walking around patrolling on there, they're also picking up uh, little caterpillars, eggs of insects that might be, uh, you know, ready to infest the leaf, and so, by paying the ants to walk around on the leaves, the plant gains some, some uh, protection. Uh, because it does cost the plant a little bit to produce that sugar water. It's, uh, you know, carbohydrates that it can't use for its own growth. But, you know, it's, it's worth the investment from the plant's point of view. Uh, 
Um, ants are also the biggest herbivores here. Uh, they eat the most plant material. Uh, not really directly, but you have uh, a whole group of ants, uh, many different species, uh, that are collectively known as leaf cutter ants. And uh, we'll see some of these on the trail as well. And these ants have very strong jaws, very sharp. Uh, if they bite you, they can uh, draw blood. They actually puncture through the skin and make a little slice, just like a little razor blade. Uh, but they don't sting. But you, you don't want to get bit by one anyway. Uh, but they go up a tree, they pick a leaf, and they just start cutting little circles out of the leaf. And a colony of these can have up to a million or a million and a half individuals in it. So if they decide that this is the tree, they can take all of the leaves off of it in one day or overnight. Frequently they work at night when it's a little bit cooler. And uh, people that raise citrus in particular uh, hate them because uh, you have your lovely citrus grove, your orange trees, your lemon trees. You wake up the next morning and half of your trees are leafless. It doesn't kill the tree, they'll grow the leaves back, but uh, it, it cuts down on the uh, number of fruit that are produced because the tree then has to put all the energy back into growing new leaves rather than into growing fruit. Uh, so they take these pieces of leaf, but they don't eat them. They take them back to their nest, they chew them up, mix them with saliva, and they grow mushrooms on them. And they eat the mushrooms. So. Uh, very, very common ant, abundant. Uh, when you find a big nest, and we'll see some nests, uh, they have trails that go off into the forest that they use to bring back the leaves. And they're like little super highways. They're flat, there's nothing on them. Uh, they're clear, you can watch them, you can follow them for hundreds of yards sometimes. It's very obvious where they're going. If there's a creek there, they'll find a, a log or something, do their little highway across it. Uh, and it's estimated that these ants are responsible for about half of all of the uh, leaf damage in the tropical rainforest. And the rest of it is, you know, deer eating the leaves, uh, beetles, <coughs> other insects that eat leaves, uh, monkeys that might eat leaves, you know, things like that. But uh, that group of ants is, uh, is hugely important here. Uh, with a big diversity of ants, no surprise that you, uh, sorry, with, of insects, no surprise that you have lots of different kinds of birds as well. And because it is a tropical climate and a fairly uh, constant climate as well, uh, the birds can specialize a lot as well. So you have some birds that specialize only on certain kinds of uh, insects. Some birds specialize in pulling insects out of rolled up dead leaves, and that's the only place that they look for insects. Uh, other birds will look for insects in holes under the bark, like woodpeckers or, uh, or uh, uh, wood creepers. And a lot of these are so specialized that they're also very rare. So you have one pair of these birds and their home range might be two square miles or something. And there's and you won't find more of those birds, you know, for several miles if you're walking into the forest. Uh, and the trick to birding here for a lot of the deep forest birds is you have to learn to recognize the voice because otherwise you just go crazy. You walk in the forest, you hear calls everywhere, you don't see a single thing. Uh, which is why it's always good, as Yurik has uh, uh, wisely suggested to start off birding along the river because there you have big open space you can look up in the trees the birds that are along the river are used to sitting out in the open and uh, and so they're much uh, much more visible uh, some of the birds here that are in the deep forest they never ever leave the forest <clears throat> they won't even you know fly across a river the size of the one out here you know they're claustrophobic <laughs> or, or agoraphobic, sorry. They're, they're afraid of open spaces. And, and so the Amazon itself and the other large rivers here 
are very important in maintaining the diversity of a lot of different animals, birds included, uh, but also fish and mammals. And you'll have one species, let's say species A here, you'll have another species that looks very similar, behaves exactly the same way, but it's distinct enough that it's considered to be a different species, different calls, on the other side of the river. So you have species pairs. This occurs with a lot of monkeys as well. Uh, obviously monkeys are probably not going to go swimming across a big river that's full of uh, large predators just for the fun of it. Um, so you have monkeys, birds, uh, a lot of snakes, frogs also, uh, that are separated uh, by rivers. You know, so you have frog one here and then frog two a very similar species just on the other side of the river and it doesn't have to be a really big river for this to happen either okay the really interesting uh, thing that I think is really interesting is the fish though um, at one time the Amazon flowed backwards it didn't flow right now it's flowing into the Atlantic Ocean uh, about 60 million years ago, it flowed into the Pacific Ocean. Uh, and that was right before the Andes Mountains started to come up. Uh, you had the South American Plate, uh, or the Nazca Plate, meeting uh, the Pacific Plate, and it started to buckle underneath, like the Continental Plates, and this one started going under, and it kicked up the, uh, the Andes Mountains. And when those started to rise up, it blocked the flow of the Amazon in that direction. And what you ended up with was a huge inland sea. I'm messing up your ex-map even more. So, so you had this inland sea here, and at various times it had connection with the Caribbean, and connection with the Atlantic down here. Uh, through the uh, you know the rivers down here and then uh, through the Orinoco River up here, all low-lying areas. But what happened was that you had a lot of animals, uh, not just fish, but also mammals like uh, the river dolphins, uh, which were more closely related to Pacific species, including species in China for in the case of the dolphins, uh, that were trapped in here. Uh, they gradually became adapted to fresh water, <coughs> and eventually there's a, a low area in here, in between the uh, Guiana Shield, which is an area of granite bedrock up here, and the Brazilian Shield, which is an area of granite bedrock down here. And eventually this lake broke through and uh, flooded into the Atlantic Ocean. And so then you also had Atlantic species of fish coming in. But what happens because of this is there are a lot of fish in the Amazon that you think of as being marine fish. And those include things like stingrays, uh, puffer fish, sardines, needlefish, uh, toadfish, uh, drum, anchovies, And there, there are several other, but uh, I mean almost all of these you think of as only being ocean fish, and yet here they are living in the rivers of the Amazon, completely uh, adapted to fresh water, soles, or flatfish, or another one that's fairly common. And there's uh, a number of species in most of these groups, there's probably 10 or 15 different species of stingrays for instance. And then uh, also the pink dolphin. Uh, 
which obviously is not a fish, it's a mammal, uh, but it's most closely related to the dolphins that live in China and India, in the freshwater rivers there. Although the uh, Chinese dolphin, I think they finally decided it's now officially extinct. Uh, but there still are uh, uh, freshwater dolphins in the Ganges River. And you'll probably see some of these. Uh, we see them on the river out here frequently when we're kayaking. Uh, when we go up to Paucarillo, we should see them as well. They're, they're not rare, uh, so fairly common. But all of these rivers in here, uh, you know, it's the biggest river system in the world. There's uh, at least 10 tributaries of the Amazon that are each over a thousand miles long. And there's about 2,000 500 named species of fish, described species of fish in the Amazon, and people think there may be as many as 5,000. Uh, in the entire Atlantic Ocean, North Atlantic Ocean and South Atlantic Ocean, uh, I think there's about 2,000 named species of fish, and who knows, by the time they finish discovering all the species of fish in the Atlantic Ocean, maybe they'll get up to 3,000 but you're still gonna have much higher diversity of fish in the Amazon basin than you have in the entire Atlantic Ocean. Uh, so it's, it's incredible diversity. Uh, and rivers are an isolating factor for fish as well. And you say, well, how can a river uh, isolate fish? I'll give you a little example. Let's say, here's the Amazon River coming down. Uh, what color was the Amazon when we were coming down river? Brown. 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 What was the visibility in it? Ten inches? <laughs> Practically zero. I mean, right at the surface, maybe ten inches, but if you go down three feet, you know, you don't see anything. If you go down ten feet, it's pitch black. Uh, you know, so... It's uh, very turbid, lots of uh, sediment in it, and because the Amazon River, all of that sediment is coming from the Andes Mountains. Uh, the, the rivers coming out of there are very fast, uh, lots of rapids, lots of waterfalls, Europe can tell you about that, and uh, the Andes Mountains are fairly young, so lots of clay, silt, rock particle in there, and this river has a pH of 7. Neutral, neutral pH. Now, the second biggest river in the world flows into the Amazon in Brazil, coming down from uh, up close to uh, Venezuela, and that's the Rio Negro. So you get the Rio Negro coming in. It's black. It's like uh, coffee color, without any milk in it. Very black, but very clean, very clear. Uh, except that you can't see anything in it because of the tannins, the dissolved plant materials that are in it. But you run it through a filter and it stays black. You don't have any dirt that comes out. Uh, and let's see, this uh, the Amazon River has a hardness of about uh, 200. Uh, you know... Probably, that's, that's a decent hardness for tap water anywhere. If you have really hard water, you get the calcium buildup on your pipes and, you know, in your coffee maker, you end up getting those, uh, those white stains in it uh, for really hard water. So Amazon water is medium hardness, uh, de decent water. You get a black water river like the Rio Negro coming in, and it has a pH of... 4.5 to 5.0. So it's much more acid than this water in the Amazon. It also has a hardness of uh, five to 10. So it's very, very soft water. Um, I mean, it's the kind of water where you, you take a bath in it and the soap never comes off. I mean, you feel like you still have soap on you no matter how long you scrub it. Uh, your hair feels totally silky after you're done. It's, uh... But uh, in terms of a fish, 
this is like going from salt water to fresh water, or vice versa. It's uh, for uh, the physiology of the fish. This is very dramatic change. And so a blackwater fish is not going to cross this river. And so you might have another blackwater river down here, another one down here, another one up here. Maybe this is a short one. You might have another whitewater river going further up. The starts in the mountains up here. And so it has a pH 7 hardness of 200 or something similar to that. And this river is isolating the fish that are in this river here. Maybe it has some little tributaries that might come close. But basically the fish in here are completely isolated from the ones in here, from the ones in here, the ones in here. And so that allows each isolated little population to evolve separately, uh, depending on the local conditions. Uh, maybe there's a big flood period or something, and uh, you know some fish just get washed over and manage to survive and make it into the, ne the, the next river system. So there might be a little bit of interchange, but not very much. And so the water itself uh, permits uh, this high diversity of fish. And there's other types of rivers in, in uh, the Amazon as well. There's uh, clear water rivers, which are crystal clear. Uh, they're more similar to black water rivers, but they're uh, down in uh, this part of Brazil and up here. Uh, we don't have any clear water rivers here. Uh, people are always asking me, well, we want to film big dolphins in the water. Where can I do it? And, you know, it's like, well, you can't do it here because you take a camera underwater, you're not going to see anything. So that's, that's a, just a little bit about the, uh, the diversity, biodiversity. Let me see what time.